it's a super creative process. And all of these technical things don't matter if it doesn't add up to serving the end result and making you, the listener, like the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm super, super excited to have Emily Lazar here. (laughs) Emily Lazar is the founder and president of The Lodge, which is a renowned audio mastering facility where she is the founder and the chief mastering engineer. So cool on so many <laughs> levels. Um, and uh, we actually met through uh, my cousin, Spencer, um, and they have a connection from their college from Skidmore. Shout out to Skidmore. Woohoo! Very, very cool where they are both alums. And Emily, you may not know her name, especially if you're not in the music industry, but you've definitely heard some of her music over the years that she's been involved in. And she's engineered over 4,000, 4,000 albums. I mean, what is that, right? That's just, I mean, a total rock star. So amazing. And she's been nominated for a Grammy eight times, winning in 2019 for Beck's album, which was absolutely amazing. And Colors, the first woman to uh, win an engineering Grammy for a non-classical album as well. And this year, three of the Album of the Year Grammy nominations were engineered by Emily as well. So, I mean, complete, complete rock star on so many levels. Um, Such a historic achievement. And Emily is making her mark in music by launching We Are Moving the Needle. And it's a nonprofit that she'll chat a little bit more about. So I'm so excited to find out how Emily went on to do what she's doing and working with artists like one of my favorites, the Foo Fighters and David Bowie and Dolly Parton. I mean, the list goes on and on. So welcome, Emily. So excited you're here. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Very exciting. So tell me a little bit more about little Emily. I mean, did you always know that you were just going to be doing what you're doing? And and did you have this love for music from the beginning? Yes. I mean, I didn't know that I was going to be a mastering engineer per se, but I knew that I would be um, somehow in, in music or in the arts um, for sure. And uh, I grew up in a very musical household. My mom was a uh, guitar teacher and my dad was a very big music appreciator. And so I thought it was normal the way that I grew up um, with, you know, my mom teaching guitar out of the house and, you know, my dad running up to me and throwing headphones on me and telling me to listen to a certain part of a song. I thought that everybody had that kind of experience. (laughs) Little did I know. So um, yeah, I I always kind of, I became a songwriter and an artist myself. And um, I think uh, Spencer probably uh, can attest to having seen me play live, which not many people can because um, I kind of switched gears and got behind the scenes um, pretty quickly after college. But um, I was kind of destined to to be in this. Um, Although there are so many aspects to my personality that I think there's lots of things I could have done. And there's lots of things that I'm interested in that I dabble in now. And I have um, a lot of interest in business and I um, do a lot of consulting for technology companies and, uh, and the like. And I'm very interested in the forward facing newer things that are coming down the pike. That's super interesting to me. When you went to college, just to give me a little bit of insight into this. I mean, what did you major in? I majored in English, creative writing and music. Yeah. Interesting. And then the technology side of it, was it, I mean, were you taking classes in that or where did you feel like you learned that? So my experience was there were not really any women taking any of those kinds of recording classes or the tech STEM based music classes Mm -hmm. as I was in a band and I was writing songs and I was really interested in the production side of things. And so when we went into the studio, I had to rely on um, the people that worked in various studios, or if we, in college, if we were in the studio at school, 
it wasn't really my place, you know, cause I didn't know anything about that and I didn't grow up playing with equipment and plugging things mm-hmm. in. And so I was really more on the creative arty, write the song, be the performer side. And I was super frustrated because the things that I was hearing inside my head were not coming out in the recordings. And because they were my songs that I was writing, there was this huge disconnect. It was like, um, you know, being a a painter and having a box full of paints and no brush, you know, (laughs) no tool. And so, so interesting. um, yeah. So, um, and, and I had to get over, uh, you know, hurdles and things to get to that point where I was comfortable enough to even learn because it was so off putting and there were so few women and it was so male dominated and not just that it was male dominated. It was also, you know, not welcoming. Um, wasn't just that it was, all men, it was that it wasn't really inviting in any way. So I think, interestingly enough for me, when I identified that I could study this stuff and that it was, there was a whole world of this that I didn't even know about, I was voracious. And so I had to know everything. And not only just because I was so interested, but because I knew that I had to be confident enough to withstand any of the barbs that would be coming my way and not be able not be pushed around or knocked off my block and be able to commit to having the confidence to to um, follow through on everything else in my life that I had a lot of confidence in you know getting up on the stage and singing a song or writing a song or having ideas was not my problem it was more translating them into this language that I didn't have a handle on I didn't know the jargon once I kind of got the tools to play the game I I was a lot a lot better off but no I was not you know you know groomed to (laughs) know how to do this at all you know it's so fascinating one of the things that I talk about in um, a lot and I talk about it in my book is that actually not having the experience when I went into the beverage industry, I had, I grew up in tech and thought, you know, had a great career in tech. And then suddenly I wanted a drink that didn't have (laughs) sweeteners in it. And so I assumed that I had to go find all these people who had worked at Pepsi or Coke, or if somewhere in the beverage industry to help me figure it out. And what I realized is that they completely discounted that I would ever be able to do it. I was a waste of time. Forget about that. I was, you know, female. I mean, we didn't even get that far. It's just that I didn't have the right resume. And so therefore I was a waste. And, and so I, you know, knew that I was vulnerable every day. I was exhausted because I was learning so much because I didn't go in thinking, I have all this experience. And what I share with entrepreneurs today is that while you have to sort of know your audience and know who the competition is out there, that it's often the people that are the most curious and the people that actually see the vision that are the ones that you should really worry about. Yeah, I think those are the those are the people. I mean, and this is like a proven thing, right? Those are yeah. the people that are the disruptors. Those are the people that are the innovators. The, you know, in my company, there was a, a very tried and true way that you did this, mm-hmm. and I approached it totally differently as well. And I took a lot of flack for it in the beginning, but um, really kind of did my own approach to something that was approached in a purely technical way before I actually brought a whole creative spin to and and kind of like this art form and with the advent of newer technologies kind of started to use them even further in that way and people were like (gasps) what is she doing you know and obviously ended up getting noticed for it with all of your Grammy nominations as well so can you explain a little bit more about what is audio mastering okay so mastering is taking a piece of music after it has been recorded, there's a, a couple processes that happen first, and it's a kind of a collaboration. It starts in the beginning with the song, right? Somebody writes a great song or any song for that matter. We yeah. hope it's great. And they um, come up with a way that they're going to record it. They think about what instruments they might want or how they want it to sound in a kind of inspirational way, right? And then maybe a producer comes along and tries to translate that vision with that 
person if they can't do it themselves into, I think you should put strings, you know, a string section here or horns or, you know, whatever, or we need more electric guitars than, than what you're doing, whatever that is to kind of like, let's use the painting analogy again. Mm -hmm. Right. So like you could, you know, a songwriter could write a song and it could be like, all in shades of blue, but there could be so many different shades. And all of a sudden, maybe a producer says, you know, what would be amazing if we did like this one streak of yellow and that would really make your other blue stuff pop out because you'd see it more or whatever. So it's kind of like this idea of creating that picture orally. And so there's the artist who, the person who writes a song, the artist, the performer, the producer, the mixer, who takes all of that paint and stuff and says, really, we need this much blue here and this much yellow here. And it should be on this kind of a canvas in this kind of a frame, right? And then you get to the mastering stage, which is where the mastering engineer would be the person who kind of does like post and film. But so with keeping with this analogy, the mastering engineer would make sure that that picture has all the right tints, that it's, you know, just blurry enough over here and just detailed enough over here and, you know, is as tall and as wide as it should be, that the frame is straight, that it's hanging on the wall and that it's presentable for anybody to go see it. So in music, that would translate to any format that you're listening on, which would be any of the ways that you could download it or have it, CD, streaming, vinyl, cassette, any of these other things that, you know, you could listen to music on. And within the streaming world, there's multiple ways to listen to um, streamed music, which consumers may not totally um, know right off the bat. But like listening to uh, Spotify is different sound quality than listening to Apple is different than listening to Tidal. They all have different so unique things about them. So as a master engineer, you create that final master for each of those formats so that it will sound the best and translate on all those different things, as well as in a giant um, club, it should sound great. And it should also sound great on these, right? So, and it should, you know, sound great on the little um, speaker that you're streaming it to that you, you know, at your party when you're not really paying attention, that should do the right thing as well. And it should sound great in your car. So there's all these various places that it has to work and, and, and work at, at its best you know, capacity. So that's what a mastering engineer does. And there's lots of ways to get there. And I know I have my own way that I kind of um, think is the way that works for me to do it. And hopefully the artists that I work with feel that it's <laughs> accomplishing that's the fair. task, but it is um, for me, it's a super creative process and always, always, always goes all the way back to serving the song. And for me, that's really easy because I was an artist and a songwriter. So that's where I come from in my mind is that at the end of the day, all of these technical things don't matter if it doesn't add up to serving the end result and making you the listener, like the hair on the back of your neck stand up or that moment where you're like, Oh, wow, that was so cool. Or, Oh, I just love this song. I have to hear it 42 times in a row. That, that feeling, right. Which is, you know, the magic stuff. What was your first song that really got noticed that people were like, wait, who did that? And, and, and I guess the next question I have is, I mean, you went from the front end, right? The creative, right? And to, to really being the behind the scenes. Yeah. What's that like? I mean, did you initially do it just to kind of help out, but then just found that you really enjoyed it? I didn't do it to help out. It was purely selfish. It was my stuff that I was working on from the that beginning. Was, okay. like, that was the, that was the, the point of entry was I want control over my artistic production. Like I, I want to be able to, uh, you know, I don't want to just tell somebody I want it to sound like this, know what I mean, and then have them give it back to me and it f fall flat. I wanted to be the person to kind of get to that place. And, and, um, and there's a big part of that in, in the production side of music. I mean, there's a lot going on. I think it was just completely motivated by selfish, um, you know, selfish endeavors of me wanting my stuff to sound a certain way. Excuse me while I have a sip of my incredible hint water. You're, you <laughs> are <laughs> welcome to have that. You know, it, it's also really interesting hearing you talk about this too, because even running, you know, my own business and something I share with other um entrepreneurs and, and founders is that understanding every aspect 
of the company. It doesn't mean that you have to do it every single day, but I would imagine that there's so many artists out there that are, you know, on the front end or however you describe it of, you know, the creators, but they don't really understand this other stuff. That's for an engineer. That's for this. And how important do you think it is for an artist to really understand these other aspects as they grow their career? I think it's really important. I think it's it's vital, actually. Um, and it's a lot for, for you need a team for sure. Mm-hmm. And I think um, the most successful artists that, that I know <clears throat> and that I've worked with have identified what they're good at mm-hmm. and how to quickly delegate um, to get the results that they want out of the people around them and find the best team. Like I said before, it's a collaboration. So even just assembling a great team, just as a business person, assembling your team is a huge part of win- winning, right? Like mm-hmm. you have to have a great team. You cannot do everything yourself. But being able to speak the language that your teammates are operating in is really important or you won't be heard. It's like everybody doesn't have a magic decoder ring to just <laughs> think like they know exactly what you're mm-hmm. thinking or how you want something to go. So, you know, for an artist, I actually personally, when I'm working with artists, I prefer that they speak to me in colors and in ideas. And like, I wanted this song to sound like a sausage pizza, but it actually sounds like a roast beef sandwich <laughs> and it is not happening for me. Like that would be great. Cause I can go like, okay, I, I totally get what they're I saying. You know, I get it. Right. I can, I can pull something out of that I that makes that. sense to me. Um, sometimes when people who are not really technical speak tech talk, it, there's something gets lost in translation, right? The, the vibe and stuff is missing and then the magic is gone somehow. Right. And, and like, if somebody said to you, you know, this flavor, I really wanted it to taste like red, you know, and it's like, it's like blue, it's like purple or blue. It's not mm-hmm. red. And you'd be like, I get that. I get it. I get what you, right. You there's, it would tell you something, oh, yeah. it would indicate something. Right. And so for me, that's the kind of dialogue that I kind of promote with my clients and with the producers who are calling me to do, to do what they need to kind of cross the finish line. I'm like, um, you know, before when you were asking me what a mastering engineer is and does like technically I told you, but if I feel more like a midwife, I feel like I'm helping or, or, or an OB or something. I'm helping somebody have a baby and it is as nerve wracking and as scary. It's like unveiling a new product or something. Will they like it? You know, Will people like my baby? Will they think my baby's ugly? Do I like my baby? Truly, you can make or break an artist. And so so who was the first that you worked outside of your own material? 3,999 because <laughs> you've worked on so many. That's so um, cool. I don't even know who to who to pick. I mean, um, you know, I've worked with like luminary visionary people like Lou Reed and David Bowie and the Beatles and and the stones and stuff like that. And then I also worked with people like, I'm like looking around the room for cues. Cause I have posters. I in love here. it. I <laughs> um, love it. It's so cool. Yeah, like what um, was it like working David Bowie? I have an amazing picture in, in my house. That's a signed, uh, incredible piece that I actually found in a, um, store in Dublin, um, Ireland. And, uh, I just, I cherish it. But, uh, what was it like working with David Bowie? I mean, I have, I have a lot of incredibly fond memories of working with him and the producer that was involved in that album was the famous, um, Tony Visconti. And we've actually did two albums together to two albums for David and, uh, and some stuff in between, but he is very, very charming and very funny. And, you know, as a, that, that itself is, you know, slightly off putting because, you know, when somebody of that level walks in the room, I think you feel the need to hopefully be, you know, making sure they're happy and laughing and you're entertaining them. And he was very, so, so aware of everyone else in the room and he was entertaining all of us. He was kind of like that, all the world's a stage kind of person. Like he walked in and he was just on and, and really funny. And so the, the funny story that I have was that we were working on the album and, and he had just seen an episode of, um, the Osborne uh, reality <laughs> show. And it was a moment he, he was imitating Ozzy Osborne 
doing, you know, yelling at Sharon, calling himself the Prince of, of Darkness, you know, and, and going on this whole rant about, you know, flying in the room on this um, thing and how he didn't want to do it. And, you know, yelling at her as she was the manager at that point in time. And but all of a sudden I, I went, oh, my God, is this reality like David Bowie? is imitating Ozzy Osbourne. And I like look around the room. There's no one else in the room. He was just trying to make me laugh, you know? And I was like, what just happened here? This is the whole world is upside down. But he made, you know, he was the kind of person that made you feel very comfortable so that you didn't, you know, it was only like in a flash that that came to me because okay. it was just really funny and he was no really normal guy, you know? And you, he made, made you feel so comfortable that he was, you know, David Bowie wasn't in the room anymore. Just this funny, charming, cool guy was in the room. But it wasn't lost on me later. And I was like, wait, that was crazy, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. And so you started your facility, The Lodge. And why did you decide to do that versus just freelancing and kind of working on other people's work? I worked at another company. And I, of course, was the only woman and the only woman that they had ever hired, the first woman that they had ever hired. And it's really, great to work for someone else so that you can create the roadmap for how you would do it if they're not doing it I love very it. well. Right. So it was very easy for me to kind of say, this is a problem. This is a problem. I don't like how they're doing this. I don't like how they're doing that. And, and who knows, you know, I just was, had convictions about how people should be treated and being, you know, empathetic leaders and, you know, just a lot, a lot of things that I just, wasn't getting there. And so, um, that was easy actually. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's kind of funny. It was like, it was like the best handbook I could have ever had. Um, and it made me not make any of those mistakes. I made plenty on my own, um, <laughs> but, um, um, I didn't make those. Uh, so that was kind of, that was good. And I started my company when I was, um, 25 years old and I always say that it was the best time to do that. A lot of people, you know, think maybe it's crazy to start something so young or, you know, you don't have all this experience under your belt. You're not, you don't have the gray hair yet. And I say gray hair is overrated. And uh, that's why I dye mine. <laughs> and, um, I love it. and so, but, you know, I, I think that being that age was very freeing because it allows you to kind of go for it in a way that, you know, wisdom and experience may hold hold you back a little bit because you maybe wouldn't be as risky you know you wouldn't be as I don't know, risky but like I don't know about you but when I was 17 and in high school I think my parents probably thought I was intolerable and I can say this because I have a 17 year old now yeah. and I yeah. remember this moment where I knew everything you couldn't I mean I just knew everything and when at that time I was 21 through 25 forget it I mean I just had it so dialed in now as a person who has managed to actually see a little bit of success and, and do some things, I'm like, Hmm, and I'm far more thoughtful about stuff than I, than I was then. I was a very, in, very keyed into my gut instincts younger. And I think I'm, I still am, I still rule by my gut, but I, I have a little more uh, thought going on, I think than I did then. And so I always, I, I mean, I always say to people to, to kind of go for it when they're, you know, hemming and hawing and stuff. And they're young. I'm like, what's going to happen if it doesn't work out, you just reinvent yourself and do something else. I see the same thing to people who are 50 and, and beyond as well. Like, yeah. okay, so it doesn't work out, wake up and do something else. It's not the end of the world. Try, right. What's the yeah. worst thing can happen? It doesn't work. Okay. Move on. You know, like it's not such a big deal, but I know that it is a bigger deal when you're, when you're, when you have more kind of hanging on your shoulders. So uh, you know, I've thought about it a lot, like what kind of propelled me at that age to have such, I don't even know if courage is the right word, but it was kind of courageous. I didn't think of it then. I kind of thought of totally it. I didn't have courageous. a choice. Yeah. Well, here's the thing though. I didn't have a choice, right? Because mm -hmm. no women were getting the positions that I wanted. No women were leading in the field. No women were even being hired. And I didn't see myself ever getting out from, you know, a uh, base level in the career or in the field at all. And I knew that I had more to offer. And so I didn't want to just be kind of like stuck there. I, it's, I didn't have a choice. Really. I didn't. I mean, I, that's is the truth. Yeah. Well, I love it. And I'm, <laughs> I'm a, a huge believer that if the opportunities aren't there for you, then you go out and create them. So, right? and 
to end this year, I just heard the statistic that 4.2 million people are going out and uh, becoming entrepreneurs. It's amazing. And I think that the pandemic has uh, spurred a lot of people to kind of rethink a lot of things, um, maybe out a of- A lot of I silver mean, linings, right? Right. And and I think it's really, really exciting. Um, and I'm sure there's some scared people out there thinking, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or not, but I'm going to go out and try. And as I say, live undaunted. And I mean, clearly what you've For done sure. is you've trailblazed this. And, and um, I think when once you start making progress and, and seeing kind of what you're doing, it's easier to look back on, on this and say, well, I was scared and now I'm, I'm still scared and I'm learning. And every time I expose myself to new yeah. things and learning things, I think that the other thing, I did a little research on you too. And, uh -oh. um, and <laughs> the other thing that I've learned about you is just your work ethic. And it's something that I'm constantly sharing with people that even when you're in environments, for example, that you may not find perfect, right? Um, you have to keep your head down and, and really do great yeah. work and be kind and all of these kind mm -hmm. of, you know, basic things that I'm sure when we were 17 years old, that, you know, it was just your parents saying, um, Oh, you know, whatever, like you have yeah. no idea what's going on, but that kind of stuff, it ends up following you and in a good for way sure. I, for you. And I think you're really known for that. How have you seen, you know, be really important. And I'm sure you've, probably seen people who have kind of been bitten um, by not acting properly along the way as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, everything that you said resonates with me really deeply. And I think that keeping my head down and staying focused and working was essential to my survival in this area. And, um, you know, now today, there are um, today, if you can even believe this 2% of the um, women producers and engineers are female, like two two percent are women, mm -hmm. like ninety eight percent are men. That's even a better way to say it. Wow, ninety eight percent are men. So that has to completely change. But it was worse before. I mean, I know this in my heart. I don't have the metrics because there was no data because there were so few of us that nobody even said hello. How many of us are there? But um, there were, you know, I, when I think about it, um, I, I guess I, I realized that it was part of my work ethic any, any way to kind of behave that way, but I had to, or I wouldn't have made it right. Mm -hmm. Because I had to keep going and keep, keep working and, and, and not get sidetracked by distractions really. Mm -hmm. And um, there were a lot of distractions and there always are. And there was lots of people that should be called out for doing terrible things and behaving poorly. And, um, you know, there's a, I, I'm, I'm very energized by the new women that are coming up and that have the ability to call out that behavior. I'm so glad that we've created an environment, hopefully with some suffering of our own as we, as it trickles down to them that now that they can kind of like raise their hand and say, no, yeah, um, no more. not having it. Yeah. Which is great. And I'm, I'm always really, um, inspired and excited for, for them because, you know, they're the badasses of tomorrow and, and we need them for sure. And I just wasn't, I don't know about you, but I didn't feel the, um, ability to do that when, you know, 20 years ago, it just wasn't, I couldn't, or I would, or I wouldn't be in, I wouldn't be talking to you today about this. I maybe would be talking about something else, but I wouldn't have been talking to you about this. Um, cause I wouldn't have been able to survive, you know, do you feel that the music industry, when, when artists are searching for an engineer, do they look for women? I mean, I always think that it's important. You have to be able to stand on your own, right. And, and actually be really, really good. But I'm, I'm curious if, if people are, are looking for women to support other women. I mean, obviously they're probably excited when they meet you um, in particular yeah. that you are a woman and that you're, you know, well, they're, they're really um, hard to find, you know, yeah, and also yeah. like, this is a new thing that women are even women were the minority in all aspects of the industry mm -hmm. as artists, as the whole, the whole business people, the whole way. So 
there are men that work with me because I'm good and not because I'm a woman or because, you know, they work with me because they heard that I'm good from so-and-so or they do a, a kind of like a blind taste test between me and someone else. And they go, wow, this is great. And we want to work with you. I think that the problem for women engineers is that there aren't enough of them and they aren't mm-hmm. getting hired. There's a, there's a history of not hiring them. So um, I'm doing the best that I can to try to, facilitate recommending people for jobs and, and, um, connecting people. And, 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 uh, you know, as you said, in the intro, I did start this initiative called we are moving the needle, which is, um, a, I was going to ask you about awesome. yeah. <laughs> it's very, um, it, So it came about because this year, um, this past year, uh, I was nominated for three album of the year Grammy award nominations, Yay, which congrats, right. Super exciting. And, um, the interesting thing about that is that it was all in one category, which is the biggest category album of the year. Right. So that's a, that in and of itself was surreal and crazy for me. And it was for, and what was uh, the album? Right. Just, uh, Heim, Coldplay and Jacob Collier. It's amazing. So, um, those three albums and each of those albums, super incredible, very unique, all really storytelling types of, um, works and all albums I'm really, really proud of being a part of the, the interesting thing about those nominations was, and it was brought to my attention by someone else was that this was the first time that a mastering engineer was ever nominated for three separate nominations in one, in that category, an album of the year. Um, or in it, I think it may have even been in any court category, but definitely it's an amazing. album of the year. Um, and the only other people that kind of matched that concept in the album of the year category were um, Pharrell and Rick Rubin, who, right, so this was a very surreal moment for me. And it was the first time that I really felt that I had done something amazing and different because every other time, five other times that I'd been nominated, um, it was a ceiling breaking moment. First woman who, first totally. woman who, first woman. And so I would get these these um, questions from the press. What does it feel like to be a woman in the music industry? What does it feel like to be a woman, the first woman to blah, blah, blah. And I get very frustrated because, you know, how about we talk about the record I made or the artistic choices we made or, you know, what, what I'm doing, what, what this is about, right. not like right. the fact that I happen to be a woman. And it was really troublesome to me. And it, And when I got the three this past year, um, and I've been doing this for a while, not my first rodeo. I all of a sudden realized that I had discounted all of those other nominations before because the immediate response was, Hey, it's so great. You broke a ceiling. You're the first woman who blah, blah, blah. So all of a sudden it felt like, Oh, I didn't really, there are all these men already did it. So like, whatever. I didn't give it like the same credence that I should have, you know, I was, yeah. Yeah, look, I was happy. I thought it was awesome, yeah. you know? Right. But I, I, there was this twinge of like, Oh, hmm, okay. Right. It's not that whatever. And so on this one, I was like, Oh, I actually did something cool. Like this is crazy because I'm not being compared to women, men, this, that, you know, this weird kind of thing. Anyway, as this was happening, um, I kind of realized that, in my heart of hearts, I knew that we weren't there yet. I knew that the numbers from the Annenberg inclusion study, which had come out, uh, I think two years prior at the time, um, which had said we were at 2.6% of the, of the industry was producers and engineers was, was women. Um, I, I knew that it was still really low. I didn't know that it had gone down at the time, but even at 2.6%, I was pretty disgusted and I had been already like speaking on lots of panels and trying to be very visible and be very helpful and in hiring and helping and doing everything I possibly could to give back, um, and volunteer. And so I had received a phone call from someone who, who, um, ran, runs a very um, awesome school in Nashville called Blackbird Academy. And Mm -hmm. the person is John McBride. John McBride is married to Martina McBride, who's the country um, Mm -hmm. artist. And, he had started this academy out of Blackbird Studios, which is a very famous Nashville, very large, mm-hmm. incredible studio. So John, on the phone, we're having this conversation and he says, you know, I haven't had a female applicant in two years. And this was like, like probably in January at some point. And 
I couldn't breathe. I was like, no, how is that possible? March is on Washington, you know, people wearing pussy hats, me too. The, the, you know, president and the CEO of the recording Academy, you know, being taken to task and blah, blah, blah. What is going on? Why is this not, I'm speaking on every panel I can. What is happening? Right. It can't be not a person, not one. I said, please tell me there was one. And she just wasn't good enough. Like you rejected her. No, no. I said, I said, I would have taken her. I said, all right. He said, can you, can you get me women students? And I was like, well, that's not what I do, (laughs) but yes, I can. Yes, I can. I will. Yes. And so, um, he said, you know, I'll give you you know, they have four terms near and four scholarships. I said, that's great. I want eight. I've always been the only woman in the room and I'm not sending someone down there to be the only woman in the room. You're going to have two. There's only two women bases in every class if you have not one. And he was like, oh, genius. Yes, I agree. I agree. Fabulous. Great. And these are big scholarships. They're not, not like a nothing. So mm-hmm. from there, I just kind of, you know, bloomed this thing into existence. And, um, in a matter of uh, a few months, we launched on, um, international women's day and the same day, uh, the Annenberg inclusion study revealed and was announced that the number had gone down. And I went, well, we couldn't have better timing with this. (laughs) This is very necessary. We need to, you know, get this thing going. And the, the initiative is all about, it's kind of like a fourfold thing, education, which, um, you know, for me, we didn't really talk about this, but after going to Skidmore, I went back and I worked in a bunch of studios and it was pretty awful. And then I got my master's degree and got really, really intense on this, this specific um, technology with, with mastering and the art of mastering. And then, um, so, and that was a kind of safe place for me to, um, be a woman and be learning and, you know, not, you know, not, not be, you know, be in a safe place to do that and ask questions and, um, be curious. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think that, um, if they're, if the programs don't have women and they're not attracting women, there's obviously some sort of disconnect going on because I see lots of women who are really into it. And I see lots of people coming to me and artists. And so there was some disconnect happening there. So, um, we wanted to do that. We wanted to make sure that women had equipment in their hands, right? So women normally getting, you know, stuffed animals and unicorns and rainbows and makeup and stuff to play with, that is all great. I love all those things Mm -hmm. (laughs) by the way, but I wasn't handed, you know, a mixing board or a microphone or even an electric guitar. Um, boys are usually handed those things to plug in and play with. So um, trying to make sure that women have access to equipment so that by the time they get to the, to getting a scholarship or getting to school, they are not a mile behind, you know, just trying to catch up on the, on the equipment level. Mm -hmm. Um, Then thirdly, um, I have a lot of really wonderful friends from the industry, from, you know, the Brandy Carlisle to Brittany Howard to, um, you know, Maggie Rogers to all these amazing women, plus, you know, the Linda Perry's of the world, amazing producers and uh, just an incredible coterie of badass women who um, kind of came forth to me and said, yes, I, we're doing this with you. This is, a, this is a gaping hole we want to help. And so all those people are sitting on our soundboard. Um, so our soundboard is a place for mentorship for the scholarship recipients and they'll get that. one-on-one help and advice from day one all the way through into their career, um, which then takes us to the next thing, which is the employment, right? After all of this, we have to get them jobs. We have to get them hired. So um, that that piece is going to happen through internships from various companies that have already dedicated you know, specific seats for just we are moving the needle candidates and um, trying to create a community where there was none. There was no alumni network. Like if I wanted to call an alumni network from college, right, I could. And if I said, okay, so I want to do, um, you know, mastering, they'd be like, great. There was no one for me to talk to. There was no, you know, there was no one to reach to. So um, creating and, and I, and because I knew that, you know, painfully from my own experience, not only 
do people have no one to like reach up to, but it's also really nice to reach down and help. Right. And you, we didn't have that, but I also didn't have this like side to side community with like, like minded women that I could talk to on my level. So it's created a, a really cool thing on, on, you know, and that wasn't the point, but it's, it ended up creating this really cool community with lots of incredible voices and smart, um, you know, <laughs> intense women who yeah. want to see change love- and want to see it fast. So, um, so that's what we are moving the needle needle is all about. And, um, and I'm so excited because it's been kind of going gangbusters and, and it's, been really rewarding to to see i just i'm gonna i want that number to change in three so we're at two percent now in three years i want to be at 30 percent in 10 years i want to be at 50 percent and 50 percent of that 50 percent needs to be non-white there's just too much of a disparity uh going on and and it's just not right not right i love it and if it's not there you go create it so i love that attitude and i hope to see more and more people having that attitude not only in their career but in pulling other people up as you're doing with we are moving the needle and so amazing to have you here and just kind of share your experience you're so inspiring and plus i i already loved you because you're a hint fan and <laughs> oh, uh beyond here. right watermelon yes. watermelon today i happen to be a big fan of like the mint the peppermint which is very hard to find Yes. Yes. We're actually out of stock on it right now. And I keep getting emails from you customers. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. yeah. I know it's, uh, it definitely is one that, that so many mm-hmm. people talk about. So I'll, I'll put funny. your request in as, as yeah, well. So where, where can people find out more about what you're doing and congratulations on all your oh. success and everything that you've uh, really plow down any walls to go and achieve. You you truly are inspiring and shed so much light just on, you know, how far you can go if you just push forward and, and go out and create and figure out your own opportunities. You're just a living example of that. So where do people find out more about Emily and follow you. you? And also we are moving the needle and uh, yeah, and just My, everything else. Um, my Instagram is Emily Lazar Lodge at Emily Lazar Lodge. My, um, the company is the lodge.com and we are moving the needle.org is, um, where we are moving the needle is. And we're also on Instagram too. And, um, we invite everyone to participate. It's not a woman's organization. It's a holistic approach. So those male allies are not only invited, but they are cherished and, um, have a lot to give and are a huge part of the solution. So we want them involved in a very big way. And um, we've got some cool announcements coming soon on on that front. And uh, and I just want to thank you for having me, number one, because this was a really fun chat. And now you have to promise that you'll come be on my podcast when I start mine, because yes. I want to ask you a million questions. Yeah, no, I, I would be honored. S- you're would... such a badass. And, um, and I love, um, you know, not only do I love the, you know, product that you created, obviously, but, um, you know, I love the story behind it. And I, I love that you were not taking no, because that's kind of where I sit too. And, and I don't understand when people take no, it's always very shocking to me when people say that, you know, Oh, they said no. So I just, you know, I'm like, what? is that yeah you no, just have to figure that, the no out is to that attitude right so um Absolutely. anyway so i'm i'm thrilled to to get to talk to you and i am um you know grateful for the chance to get to mind meld with you because it feels very like simpatico and i love that so yeah no i absolutely love it well thank, thank you. you everybody for listening and and sharing our conversation overall with uh, all of your friends please share this let people know 
know about the Kara Golden Show. I've, I've uh, got some amazing, amazing guests, including Emily, to come and share a little bit about her career and her journey and, uh, and really showing everybody that if you believe in yourself and push forward, that that's the most important thing. And, and bringing other people up is, is always a really, really important aspect. So thank you again. And everybody have a great rest of the week.